One of the highlights of the commencement exercises each year is the welcoming of our honored guest and keynote speaker. I could not be more honored to introduce this year's speaker, Senator Josh Hawley, to the King's community today. A native of small town Lexington, Missouri, in rural Lafayette County, Senator Hawley graduated from Rockhurst High School in Kansas City. After graduating from Stanford University in 2002 and Yale Law School in 2006, he moved back home to Missouri with his wife, Erin, where they started a family. They are the proud parents of two young boys, Elijah and Blaze. Senator Hawley is recognized as one of the nation's leading constitutional lawyers, clerking at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit, as well as the United States Supreme Court. He later litigated at the Supreme Court, the Federal Courts of Appeals, and in state court, fighting for people's liberties. He previously fought Obamacare at the Supreme Court and won as one of the lead attorneys in the landmark Hobby Lobby case. He was also a lead attorney in the Hosanna Tauber case at the Supreme Court, protecting the rights of churches. Holly is known for taking on tough fights against powerful special interests and big government, including taking on big opioid manufacturers and cracking down on human trafficking. In the Senate, he has been a leader in questioning big tech companies over censorship, antitrust issues, as well as the bipartisan push for updating online privacy for the 21st century. He has also been an outspoken advocate for religious liberty issues and the pro-life movement. His career to date demonstrates how he represents the interests of families, local communities, and small businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, class of 2019, would you please join me in welcoming Senator Hawley. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Gibson, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to be here in this great city on this fine day to mark this auspicious occasion. For today, the King's College will again send into the world an accomplished class of young women and men sitting here before me, trained and ready to serve Christ in our time. And that is reason indeed for celebration. To the parents of the graduates who are here today, I say to you, congratulations. You are surely proud, and rightly so. This is a day to give thanks for all that the Lord has done. To the class of 2019, I say, wow, you make me feel old. <laughs> if I've got my math right, and it was never my strong suit, but if I've got my math right, when you were born, I was almost finished with college. You know, I'm 39 years old this year, and that's about the time of life that you start looking for things to make you feel young again. And now you know why I ran for the United States Senate, <laughs> where the average age is dead. <laughs> you know, when I got sworn into the Senate, they gave me a, a little pen, a lapel pen. I, I wear it right here, and it also doubles as a life alert button. You know, I could just press it. All that to say, class of 2019, it's awfully generous of you graduating seniors to be listening to this freshman on this year graduation day. And I want to commend you more than anything. You have successfully completed a rigorous course of study at a historic institution. And your effort and your excellence have made your families proud. Congratulations. But your work is only just beginning. For the wider world now beckons you, and it is a world in need. And so this morning, I remind you of the words of the Apostle Paul, fan into a flame the gift that God has given you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of discipline. And you will need all three to meet the challenges of our present age. For we stand at one of the great turning points in our national history, when the failure of our public philosophy and the crisis of our public life can no longer be ignored. And what we do about these needs will define the era that is to come. For decades now, our politics and our culture have been dominated by a particular philosophy of freedom. It is a philosophy of liberation from family and tradition, of escape 
from God and community, a philosophy of self-creation, an unrestricted, unfettered free choice. It is a philosophy that has defined our age, though it's far from new. In fact, its most influential proponent lived 1,700 years ago, a British monk who eventually settled in Rome named Pelagius. So thoroughly have his teachings informed our recent past and precipitated our present crisis that we might refer to this as the age of Pelagius. And here's the irony. Though the Pelagian vision celebrates the individual, it leads to hierarchy. Though it preaches merit, it produces elitism. Though it proclaims liberty, it destroys the life that makes liberty possible, replacing it and repairing the profound harm it has caused is one of the great challenges of our day, and it is the challenge that awaits you, class of 2019. Now here's your final test before you leave the halls of learning. Who was Pelagius? Does anybody know? Does anybody remember? You know, it's not every monk who has his own heresy. Pelagius was born sometime between 350 and 360 AD in Britain, possibly Wales, highly educated, unusually gifted, a scholar of both Latin and Greek. He made his way to Italy and there to Rome, where he became famous for his teachings on Paul's letters. Pelagius held that the individual possessed a powerful capacity for achievement. In fact, Pelagius believed individuals could achieve their own salvation, and maybe you've heard of him in that connection. Pelagius said it was just a matter of individuals living up to the perfection of which we are all inherently capable. Here's how Pelagius himself put it. Since perfection is possible for man, it is obligatory. Since perfection is possible for man, it is obligatory. The key, he said, was will and effort. If individuals worked hard enough and deployed their talents wisely enough, then they could be perfect. This idea famously drew the ire of Augustine of Hippo, better known as Saint Augustine, who responded that we humans are not achievement machines. We are fragile. We are fallible. We have weaknesses. We suffer need. And all of us stand deeply in need of God's grace. But Pelagius was not satisfied. He took his stand on the idea of human freedom. He responded that God gave individuals free choice, and he insisted that this free choice was more powerful than any limitation Augustine had identified. You know, Augustine said human nature was permanent. Pelagius didn't think so. Pelagius said individuals could use their free choice to adopt their own purposes, to fix their own destinies, to create themselves, if you like. And that's why a later follower, Pelagius, said freedom of choice is that by which man is emancipated from God. Now, as you might expect with followers who say things like that, Pelagius was condemned as a heretic by the Council of Ephesus in 431. But his philosophy, and this is my point to you today, his philosophy has lived on in late 20th century and early 21st century America. And if you listen closely, you can hear it almost everywhere. In our fiction and in our film, in our school curricula and self-help books, it even features prominently in our law. Perhaps the most eloquent contemporary statement of Pelagian freedom cam comes in an opinion from the United States Supreme Court in a passage written by former Justice Anthony Kennedy. In 1992, in a case called Casey versus Pennsylvania, he wrote this, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mysteries of human life. It's the Pelagian vision. Liberty is the right to choose your own meaning, define your own values, emancipate yourself from God by creating your own self. In <clears throat> indeed, this notion of freedom it says you can emancipate yourself not just from God, but also from society, from family, from tradition. The Pelagian view says the individual is most free when he or she is most alone, able to choose his or her own way without 
interference. Family and tradition, neighborhood and church, these things get in the way of uninhibited free choice. And this Pelagian idea of freedom is one our cultural leaders have embraced for decades now. But here's the paradox. For all the big talk about individual freedom, Pelagian philosophy has made American society more hierarchical and it has made it more elitist. This is no accident. Pelagius himself was most popular with the old senatorial families of Rome, the wealthy, the well-educated, the well-connected, the aristocrats. Those were his patrons. And why? Because he validated their position and their power. Because if freedom means choice among options, then the people with the most choices are the most free, and that means the wealthy. And if salvation is about achievement, then those with the most accolades are the most righteous, and that means the elite and the strong. A Pelagian society is one that celebrates the wealthy, prioritizes the powerful, rewards the, rewards the privileged. The class of 2019, for too long now, that has described modern America. In the last five decades, our society has become hierarchical. Consider this, if you are wealthy or well-educated, and yes, graduates, this now includes you, your life prospects are bright. College graduates and those with advanced degrees enjoy markedly higher wages. They rarely divorce. They have higher life expectancy. They enjoy better access to health care. Their children attend better schools and score better on achievement tests. They have more opportunities for civic involvement and participation. But if you don't have family wealth and if you don't have a four-year degree, and that's 70% of Americans, 70%, the future is far less glowing. These Americans haven't seen a real wage increase in 30 years. These Americans are fighting to hold their families together. For these Americans, health care is unaffordable. Drug addiction is growing. And too many local communities, especially rural ones, like the place where I grew up, have been gutted as industry consolidates and jobs ship away. A society that is divided by class, where one class has all the advantages, is a society gripped by hierarchy. It is also a society defined by elitism. Of course, our elites don't use that word. They say their privileged position comes from merit and achievement. They point to their SAT scores and prestigious degrees. They talk about economic efficiency. How Pelagian of them. The truth is, the people at the top of our society have built a culture and an economy that work mainly for themselves. Our cultural elites look down on the plain virtues of patriotism and self-sacrifice, things like humility and faithfulness. They celebrate self-promotion, self-discovery, self-aggrandizement, self, self, self. And then when industry ships jobs overseas, they say, well, workers should find another trade. I mean, capital must be allocated to its most efficient use. When workers without college degrees can't get a good job, they say that's their fault. They should have gone to college. Now, I rather suspect, it's just a hunch, that if globalization threatened America's tech industry or its, say, banking sector, that we would hear a different tune. I slightly suspect we would hear how these industries are the lifeblood of the American economy and must be defended at all costs. And that's just my point. The elites assume that their interests are vital while everyone else's can be done without. They assume their value preferences should prevail while denigrating the loves and loyalties of the great middle of America. That's the nature of elitism. And at the end of the day, this hierarchy and this elitism threaten our common liberty. For the steady erosion of working class jobs and working class life for millions of Americans means losing respect. It means losing their voice. It means losing their standing as citizens in this nation. Our Pelagian public philosophy says liberty is all about choosing your own ends. That turns out to be a philosophy for the privileged and for the few. For everybody else, for those who cannot build an identity based around what they buy, for those whose life is anchored in family and home and nation, for those who actually want to participate in our democracy, 
Today's Pelagianism robs them of the liberty that is rightfully theirs, and we cannot afford to let it happen any longer. The age of Pelagius must end, and graduates, you must end it. Do you know why the Council of Ephesus ultimately condemned Pelagius as a heretic? It wasn't because he misunderstood Augustine. It was because he misunderstood the cross. Pelagius had not learned the meaning of Paul's words to the Corinthians when he wrote, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, brothers. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He chose what is low and despised in the world so that no man might boast in the presence of God. The cross announces the weakness and need of every person, and that means it excludes the boasting and the pride of the few. The cross says the talented, the well-born, the well-educated do not deserve special privileges. They are not more valuable than everyone else. The call of God comes to every person, and the power of God can work through each and is poured out on all who believe. In fact, and pay attention to this, class of 2019, Paul says it is the humble, it is the everyday, it is those without social status through whom God chooses to exercise his power. Think about that. And so it is not the privileged, but it is the common man and woman. It is not the elite, but it is the everyday person who moves the destinies of the world. That burning insight was once the animating principle of American life, and we must make it so again. We must rebuild a culture that affirms the dignity of the working man and woman, that protects their way of life and honors their central role in the life of this country. We must rebuild an economy that will offer opportunity to every American worker, whatever degree she might have, wherever she may live, an economy that rewards hard and productive work, for that, after all, is the work that built this country. We must rebuild a democracy run not by the elites, but by the great middle of America, a democracy that allows the working man and working woman to realize their God-given ability to govern themselves and help manage the life of this nation. That is the great task of this hour. And graduates, what about you? Graduates, God has given you much, and to whom much is given, much is expected. And now you face a signal choice. Will you retreat into the enclave of the elite to pursue your private pleasures and make your own life comfortable? Will you join the society of those who believe that they have a right to rule others? Or will you use your elite education, your excellent education, your training, your gifts to serve others? Will you affirm the dignity of every life? Will you celebrate the contributions of those who do not live on a coast or boast a fancy degree? Will you work for the prosperity of all and not just the few? Will you hear the voice of the forgotten? Will you embrace the way of the cross? That is the question you must answer. And I submit to you that on that question depends the future of this country. But I have great confidence in you, class of 2019. And even more, I have confidence in the Lord who calls you. And because I do, I believe the night is far gone, the age of Pelagius is ending, and a better future is near at hand. Build that future, class of 2019. Build it for us all. Thank you very much.